Hey, Alyssa. Hey, Sam. Are you ready? I'm so ready. Dr. Badali, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's Woo. hit it. Okay, you guys, we are so excited. We are here with Dr. Badali. Uh, she is a registered psychologist. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Badali, in any of this. She's a registered <laughs> psychologist. She has over 20 years of experience, uh, and she has graciously agreed to come on the podcast today and talk to us primarily about phobias. I'm so interested in phobias. Me too. I, as you guys know, have a lot of... <laughs> quirks i would say um and is that the term we're going with <laughs> that's the medically uh yes because i haven't been diagnosed so i'm not trying to diagnose myself okay i have quirks um and i've just been i've, I've been really interested in it, everything kind of like anxiety related because as you know i developed anxiety um in my teenage years which was odd for me i didn't realize that that was going to be a thing that happened and uh, i got really uh recently interested in phobias so uh she's agreed to come on here and talk to us about that and um and maybe some anxiety and stuff like that as well so uh thanks again for coming on here before we get like jump right into the the phobia talk um i kind of wanted to ask just some questions about you and like your practice and kind of like why you became um, a therapist and, and all that. Sure. I'd be delighted to answer those questions. What made you decide to, to pursue that role? Um, well, I started my university career not knowing really what I wanted to do. And I took a psychology course because I thought it would be interesting. And, and, um, you know, in that first year, I really started to fall in love with the subject. It became more and more interesting to me, um, you know, and as is often the case when people find their passion, there's like this personal piece plus this, you know, kind of set of skills that, that you have that sort of matches that. And um, at the time, uh, as a human, I was going through something difficult because my mom had breast cancer. And so that was a lot on my mind. And I just, I was fascinated by the research that showed that support groups for women with breast cancer uh, could help not only them feel more supported, but also help them, you know, in, in the, their cancer journey in terms of increasing, um, you know, how long they survived. And that just like blew my mind. And, you know, I was, uh, you know, so interested in the, this interface between um, what I at the time thought was like mental health and physical health. And now I look at it as just all health. Right. And so that's, you know, kind of a big shift that's come over time for me as I've, you know, learned more about uh, how humans work. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, it just my interest grew and grew and grew. And I think I had always sort of had this idea before I started university that oh, I'll get good grades and then I will go to law school or, you know, something like that. And uh, I, I kept getting good grades in psychology. And I was like, oh, this is good. But I think part of it was I was interested in it. And, it, you know, something just clicked for me. And then when it was time to um, think about applying for a law school, I was like, ah, I think I want to be a psychologist. Like, I'm really interested in the psychology thing. And, you know, I wanted to help people as a lawyer, but I, I think I want to help people as a psychologist instead. And so that was kind of the the pathway that led me there, this sort of combination of interest and then, well, wait, like, I think I'm actually kind of, you know, not, not horrible at this. So that, that was kind of my pathway. That's, um, I was actually reading something kind of um, recently about um, pregnant women going through labor and uh, it was showing studies um, basically saying that women that experienced non-judgmental care were less likely to have like complications during birth, less likely to have C-sections and stuff like that, which to me, it's like, it's so crazy to look at something that's such a short amount of time really but it's so impacted by the people around you and how you're being treated kind of emotionally and mentally sure yeah it's it's, it's all um so related like when you think about it it makes so much sense like if you feel comfortable that you can communicate what you're experiencing in your body and you're not afraid to speak up and say something is really wrong here so you know uh, that makes sense that you would end up with better medical care if mm -hmm. there's that psychological safety in place. I mean, it seems like a no brainer. And yet, we have strained resources, we have, you know, kind of limited access to certain things. And, and uh, the psychological piece often goes, um, you know, by the wayside. Uh, and so that's, you know, one of the things that I do, uh, you know, as part of my service volunteer work is really try and be an advocate for mental health, generally, and anxiety, uh, in particular. 
I'm curious, um, because you've been doing this for such a long time now, do you notice like a shift in the stigma around mental health and mental illness? Yes. And fortunately, I notice it uh, trending in the positive direction. I mean, not trending as in more stigma, but like less stigma. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how to speak trends and, <laughs> into it and, stuff, and stuff like that. I'm just like, I'm your nerd guest. So, you know, feel free to translate what I'm saying, into, yeah. you, know, you know, into something that makes sense uh, for your cooler audience than me. Um, but uh, yes, I do. And it's, you know, it's interesting, you know, growing up, I don't even know if I ever heard the word anxiety, right? Like I, that yeah. was just, you worried, uh, you know, that was just part of life. Right. Like, <laughs> I didn't even really, uh, you know, associate with the, the word anxiety until later. And I started learning more about it. And, um, you know, I was really lucky that when I had my first panic attack, I was actually in grad school. So I knew what was happening. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is a panic attack. And that made the experience so much easier for me than it would have if nobody had been talking about anxiety. I didn't know what it was. I felt shame for even having it. Um, and so I... I know even just in, in my, you know, life outside of psychology, in terms of people approach me and, and talk to me about anxiety, um, you know, more so now than ever before. Um, and it's very exciting. There's still a ton of stigma uh, for mental health and addictions in particular. The stigma is really still so there. So we still have a ways to go on that. But, um, you know, thank you for having me here because every little pot, not little pot, but every, you know, podcast, every piece that we can do uh, has the potential to chip away at that stigma. Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say, I, I agree with the addiction stigma. I I have been around addiction so much. I've struggled with addiction. I, um, I have seen, uh, I would say, like anxiety and depression, you know, kind of like making these like yeah, it, yeah, and and I know that some people get upset when I say depression and anxiety as if they're the same. I know that they're not the same. Um, usually, I say that because I have anxiety and Sam has depression, <laughs> so I <laughs> I do it that way. But I've seen uh, these two, you know, m- mental illnesses kind of make their way into um, social media, especially and getting you know this the stigma removed. But I'm I've been struggling to see the same with addiction, and actually, that's something that yeah, I would love to be able to have a hand in as well but it is it is really hard and we see it a lot too here in Vancouver when um I would say like tourists especially come to visit and they're oh yeah you know they're so horrified and and um whatever we have a street um called East Hastings where um you know unfortunately a lot of homeless and addicts and um disabled people you know reside and um it's it's really hurtful for me to hear the tourists speak of it in such a way because I feel like there's such a lack of understanding and compassion. Well, and a lack of resources as well. So it's just like a lot of complaining about these people that really need help and resources and they don't have access to them because we, you know, don't serve these people. Yeah. So for sure. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point. And it just reminds me of, you know, even with the in the category of stigma, there's the stigma we place on other people like those tourists, but there's also the stigma we place on ourselves. And both of them drag us down. Right. You know, not being able to speak up, not being able to seek help, um, you know, and so I think that that there's yeah many, many layers to um, chip away. And and also we need to have the resources there when people need the help. Like you were saying, you know, you're looking Mm -hmm. and, you know, um, that someone who lives in Vancouver as well, like, you know, you can't walk down East Hastings without feeling something. Right. Of course, yeah, yeah. Right? And so for us, maybe it's compassion and sadness and like, oh, you know, maybe for someone else, it's activation. Okay, how am I going to change this? And maybe for some tourists, because they, they're just visiting, that they, it's disgust or anger. Mm-hmm. Or who knows? I mean, we, we there's this range of emotions that, you know, we can experience. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, right now we're, we're talking a lot, um, you know, in the Vancouver area about well, everywhere, actually, because of the pandemic about COVID-19. But we do have another, uh, you know, pandemic uh, upon us. There is another crisis. And certainly in Vancouver, um, we have a fentanyl crisis. And it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's um, killing people and it's bad. Um, so, yeah, so I think the more that we can talk about all this stuff, uh, you know, 
take the layer of shame that often goes as the side to anxiety and depression, of which there is actually a huge overlap. <laughs> oh. you know just so you know the research actually supports you on that there's a, a lot of overlap there um and addictions and i think you know talking about it is one way to do that for sure yeah absolutely and i'm sorry i know i always go on tangents but i, <laughs> I wanted to get this into um what you were saying about the the resources needing to be there it is so hard because i find too i mean obviously addiction is um it's so different for everybody but one day you might be able and willing to get help but that help might not be able to be afforded to you Mm -hmm. until six months down the line or nine months down the line or you you have to jump through all of these hoops and you know to somebody who maybe is not struggling with addiction it's easy for you to say okay just wait just just go in and sign this paper but for somebody who's struggling with addiction you know it it's like now or never yeah that and that is sometimes how it feels right Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think there's there's certain readiness and we go kind of up and down and where we are in terms of our, our readiness to change and to, to help and they're, you know, having the different pieces there for where people are at. Um, you know, one of the things that I do in my private practice, which I can do because it is me and one other person is tailor, um, you know, what we're going to do to where they're at. Right? right. But when you have sort of, you know, it, it's that's a that's a, a luxury in in mental health right now. I mean, and to me that I would want that just to be, you know, kind of the way that we go, that people can get the help they need, the, you know, those the type of treatment that's going to work best for where they're at when they're able to say, I, I want it, I need it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so in terms of your specialties, um, predominantly anxiety, is that correct? Yes, that is the thing that I see the most. But as you probably can guess, that comes with all sorts of friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <For sure. laughs> um, and frenemies, you know, substances and uh, eating stuff and uh, depression and, you know, uh, shame, uh, mood stuff. So usually the the door to see me is anxiety, but we uncover lots of other issues along the way. And sometimes uh, for me, because I am a specialist, I will suggest that somebody else see another specialist who's going to be able to help them better. Um, but usually we, you know, tackle the anxiety piece. Um, unless, I mean, the, the reality is if somebody um, is uh, severely depressed, I, I usually would tackle that before I t- tackle anxiety. It just kind of de- depends. But um, yeah, anxiety is the area that I have uh, really spent the most time uh, kind of researching, learning about, and, um, you know, kind of applying at a clinical level with people. And it's also the area where I've done the most um, uh, just volunteer work and, and service work and trying to raise awareness and, and um, help increase access to um, services and good quality information. Sam and I on on this channel, well, and it just in general, we really boast about our experience with cognitive therapy and, and really support it. Um, and a lot of our listeners and my followers have reached out and they they say that they are nervous or they're scared to, to find a therapist and um, it's hard for them to take that first step and what if they don't like me and stuff like that. Is there any, I guess... You can't give, obviously, specific advice, um, but is there anything you would say to, like, those people who are, are feeling nervous to take the first step in into therapy? Take it. <laughs> and, and, right? and, and, but keep in mind that if it doesn't work out, it's not just you. And so that sense that you have that the relationship matters is evidence-based. So science-based, we know that the relationship between a therapist and a client is an agent of change. It makes a difference. People who have good relationships with their therapists do better. Um, You know, there's also techniques that you can learn and goals. And, you know, it's definitely as someone who, um, you know, works with people with anxiety, I highly recommend you look for somebody who's trained in cognitive behavior therapy because there's lots of research studies that show that that's a good, you know, gold standard frontline, try this first for anxiety treatment. Um, But if somebody who's delivering that treatment to you is doing it in a dismissive, snotty manner, 
then you're not going to get a lot out of that. And, you know, you know, early on in my career as a student, I was in a, a group therapy setting and I was a student and the um, psychologist left for a minute. And I guess because I was a student, I was kind of like more like the inside of the group. And they were like, cognitive, that's such a snotty word. Why wouldn't they just say thought? And I was like, yeah, really? You're right. <laughs> like, um, you know, and, 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 and often, you know, when I am introducing it, I'm like, kind of, it's just a fancy word for thoughts. It really is, right? Like, you know, I, I think sometimes we have to think about our branding as psychologists. We're like, oh, fancy words and, you know, where things come from. But, um, you know, I think that, you know, that relationship piece is important. Unfortunately, um, you just don't know until you start making that journey. And I know it's expensive shopping for a therapist right? It's, it's especially yeah. if it's private pay. And if you, if it's not private pay, then you kind of get what you get. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, you know, there's not a lot of choice. But I think um, if that's what's holding you back, um, I would actually try and work on that. Because the sooner you start experimenting, it's like dating, you're gonna kiss some yeah. frogs, right? But um, the sooner that you get out there, the sooner you'll have a chance of finding a match. And, you know, in the same way, um, you know, that you can be a princess all along and be kissing frogs, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just, you know, about the match. Don't, don't kind of lose sight of that. And, and I really, I mean, for me, when a client comes to see me that first session, I really emphasize that I check my ego at the door. I want you to find somebody who's going to be a good fit for you and get you where you want to be as fast as possible. And if that's not me, that's okay. And if you can kind of figure out why that's not me, than me or our, you know, kind of office manager can try and match you to somebody who is going to be a better fit. And let's not wait, you know, till you've spent your budget or, you know, we, we it hasn't worked for you. Like, let's do that as soon as possible. Um, you know, and again, we don't necessarily, not everybody has that luxury, but I really would just encourage you if you, if you think therapy could be of a benefit to me, start the process. It's hard. You need to be, it, you know, you have to be brave. It's, Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's very vulnerable going, going to therapy it's, or yeah. taking your kid to therapy or going with, like it, you think, okay, this is a good thing. This is for my health. And then you're there and you're like, ugh, like, yeah, I, I cried, cried my, my whole first session. Oh, I was my so God, nervous. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. You know what? That happens all the time, Alyssa. Like yeah. you should see, oh, I wish like, in our storeroom at our clinic, like there is a wall of, of, of tissues, facial tissues. <laughs> <laughs> Take a complimentary box on your way out. <laughs> it's an ex such an expensive first cry session. But, you know, the way that we work is crying actually sheds cortisol. So when you think, like, of all the stress that goes in, and even sometimes, like, it's enough to just throw you off when you have trouble finding parking, you're in this new place, you're this new person, you don't know if they're going to judge you. Often we judge ourselves more harshly than anybody else judges us. So we're all like, oh, they're going to think I'm um, this or I don't know. It's it's hard. It, it is hard. And I think that if you go into that knowing that it's going to be hard, it actually ends up making the process easier. I don't know, if, um, you know, Vancouver people. When I first moved to Vancouver, there was a deal at the local mountains to learn to snowboard. I was like, oh, okay, now I'm in Vancouver. I was like 23. I'm like, I'm going to learn to snowboard. And the first uh, lesson, it was like five lessons, and some night skiing or something. It was like student special, really cheap. And uh, the instructor said, you're going to spend this whole session on your butt. <laughs> and you know what? It was the best thing that instructor could say because I knew, oh, I'm not going to be like, you know, swishing around and having fun. I'm going to be spending on my and that is normal. And that's where I'm going to be. And it's going to be a process that I'm going to, it's going to take me time till I start feeling better. And with therapy, especially that first session, we don't do any treatment. It's assessment. You, you're you being so vulnerable. You can often feel worse after that first session. And so mm -hmm. again, I have that in my welcome letter, like that's normal. You, you may actually feel worse before you get better. Um, you know, you, it, commit to the process. Um, yeah. And I think now that, you know, like, for example, you guys are, are doing this podcast and a lot more uh, therapists are you know, engaging in little videos or different things or blogs, stuff like that. Sometimes you can actually get a sense of a person's um, style by watching or, or listening. So that's another thing that people can do is do a little search and, and see if that therapist's name pops up. Um, some therapists will do free 15-minute consults. I don't. I'm too 
I don't know, sounds naughty, but I, I am, I'm just too busy to do that. Um, but uh, some, some counselors will offer that. So that's another option too. That's good to know. Actually, I didn't know that. Yeah. And the looking up um, like where they might have like videos and stuff like that is a really, really good Tool. thing to mention as well, because I wouldn't have thought of that either. You know, at, and at the same time, I would also, you know, let your listeners know that just because a, a therapist has zero uh, media presence or internet presence doesn't mean they're not good. Because a lot of times, same, like, especially if you're, at, I'm middle-aged, you know, I'm 40 years old I'm old enough that I forget how old I am. Uh, I'm 46. And then you get to this certain stage if you didn't grow up with that being part of, you know, like your profession, um, then to add that is like extra time away from, oh, okay, if I'm going to create this, that's one less client I can see. Or if you have a family, that's one less, like, you know, kind of piece. And if you're, if you already have a wait list, it's, one of those things that like unless you're really passionate about it or interested in it um it, it's sort of hard to do so there's a, a lot of uh, therapists and i'm actually going to say especially like kind of my age or older who don't have that presence out there but are very very good so again you can't use that as a as a sign that they're yeah. they're no good it's, sure. it's hard it really it really is hard but i i i truly believe that it it is worth starting that journey um, and it sounds like you guys are on the same uh, page with that as, as well. And, and the research is too, especially for anxiety disorders, right? Yeah, for, for sure. sure. I wanted to kind of ask going into phobias, kind of like linking that to anxiety. Do you find that anxiety kind of lends sometimes to phobias? Yeah, so phobias are actually considered a type of anxiety disorder, and they're the most common type of anxiety disorder. Um, you know, if you look around, the, the, there's lots of people who have phobias. It's just that, you know, if you're afraid of snakes and you live in Vancouver, you're not going to see that many snakes. That's not going to really it, interfere, you know, with your life. But, you know, if you're afraid of mountains, that would be, you know, more of a, a problem. And so when we think about phobias, we think of them as being very intense um, and being out of propor- uh, proportion fears about specific places situations or things and so that kind of out of proportion piece is key like it's normal to be afraid of a ferocious tiger that's you know running at you um but if there's a picture of a ferocious tiger you know on a bulletin board in your school and you're not going into your school that's out of proportion that's unreasonable so one of the things that you can think of you know kind of across the board not just for phobias but for anxiety in general is that it's an overestimation of the threat or danger combined with an underestimation of your um, your perception of your ability to cope or your resources to handle that situation. So that's that's anxiety, whereas fear, fear is that very primal, like danger is here, danger is now, I'm reacting to that, you want that. You don't have to think I should become scared now and then please activate all the chemicals that will make me be able to run away or fight of this. You want that to just be um, automatic in the same way as with your smoke alarm in your house. You want that just to be able to go off. If there's a false alarm, you're like, okay, that's no big deal. I'd rather there be a false alarm every once in a while than it not go off when there's a fire. And so I look at anxiety as, you know, it's your fear false alarm. It's like trying to help you. It's Mm. like, hey, here we go. You know, there, there could be a problem there, right? And if you look at how your brain works, and that that's just kind of that very old automatic brain in your, uh, you know, sort of your visual system, seeing a picture of a tiger could spark it. If you're if you had like the top of the line, very expensive smoke alarm, and, you know, maybe it would go off. Uh, I had to cancel on you guys because of the, um, uh, we had the power outage. But the other thing we've been having in Vancouver is the the, uh, the wildfire smoke oh, 2020 yeah. has been super fantastic year yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and uh uh one of our neighbor's smoke alarms went off for the wildfire smoke oh wow oh, right? god and so you know what it was smoky it made sense that it went off but it wasn't the kind of smoke alarm that you need to actually match your actions to and call the fire department and leave your house and so I think this is where we have these, you know, kind of, we, we come kind of loaded with some stuff with our brains, 
right? And that's handy, but not all of it is useful all of the time, right? And so we can't treat our emotions as directions. We have to be like, okay, okay, thanks for the heads up, anxiety. Okay, I'm going to now survey the situation. So, um, you know, one of the things that happens in our brain is this kind of that we have this part of our brain called the amygdala. There's we we actually have two of them, these little almond shaped things, and they're they're good. Like, they're like the brain's watchdog. Like, hey, <laughs> um, you know, and they can there's connections to the fight or flight um, or freeze response, which is our our body's um, kind of automatic way of dealing, preparing us to deal with danger. So, you know, again, there's a lot of these things that are happening automatically and they're, they're meant to ha- help us and be adaptive. It's just that they don't always work for a modern society. And for some of us, we have extra sensitive, <laughs> uh, you know, smoke alarms. So I just have a very top of the line smoke alarm <laughs> is what we're saying. <laughs> yes, they're just exquisite. We would, we would, some people would charge more for that. The Ferrari. Yes. You are the Ferrari. There you go. You, you know, know what? One time a therapist told my dad that he had a Ferrari brain. So it would make sense that I inherited that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not a bad brain package to have, right? Like, I mean, and if you look at Ferraris, they go fast, but like the maintenance on them, it would cost you a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> the maintenance on my body does cost me a fortune. <laughs> yes, you, you need that extra special care. Yeah. Um, You're worth I'm, it. You're worth it. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm interested to know, um, and I don't know if you know the answer, but I'm interested to know if we see a correlation of phobias in di- like in different areas of the world, say for Vancouver, I guess, where there's a lot of rain. I don't know if there's a phobia of flooding, but something like that a or flo- phobia for everything. Yeah, yeah I guess so. Um, or like in Australia, if there's a, like a large phobia of spiders or if it's the opposite because you're so used to that stimulus, if it's like the opposite and what you see less is what we generally see phobias. I think that is an excellent question. I mean, short answer, I don't know the answer. Okay. <laughs> but longer spe- speculation is... I mean, there are certain ones that seem to be fairly universal, animal, natural environments, heights, uh, you know, water, um, injections, people putting stuff into your body, (laughs) Um, uh, situation, confined spaces, uh, people vomiting. There seems to be some of these that just really, uh, I think, are kind of, think about it this, do either of you have a pet? Yes. Yes. Okay, so think of it this way, like, if my pet could be afraid of it, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Chances are people all over the world also can be afraid of it. And that's not a bad thing, because again, this is supposed to be this innate, adaptive um, kind of safety mechanism for us. Now, I think you bring up a really good question, which is, what would it be like in different places? And I think this is, again, just, you know, kind of based on what I know, I think there'd be two things. One like you mentioned, if there's a lot of of it around, I think people could habituate to it. So, you know, they're exposed to it a lot, then they learn, oh, you see this kind of spider, um, it doesn't always mean you're going to, you know, get bitten and die. And there's no way to avoid it. Because one of the things that happens with um, phobias is is we get scared, then we avoid the thing, and we don't get to learn that that thing actually isn't as dangerous as we think. So if there is a million of, insert whatever creepy crawly or thing that there is, I think you would you would start to get used to it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it could also, if, if it really was persistent and stuck around, could be debilitating, whereas if you move somewhere else, it wouldn't be. And so I do think there's kind of that, I think, I think there would be the potential for because of exposure, which is one of the things that we, we do in cognitive behavior therapy with people is get them to have different safe experiences with the thing that they're afraid of to to change that relationship in the brain from this thing means danger to this thing means safety is fine um that there is that i mean just thinking again because i talk about snowboarding and i'm making myself sound more mountainy and cool than i actually am because i am (laughs) a big book nerd um uh, but you know i've i've treated somebody for a chairlift phobia I don't think that's something that's going to pop up anywhere I don't think 
Like, I mean, there might mm-hmm. be plenty of people who are afraid of chairlifts, but it's not going to ruin their life. It's not going right. to make it hard for them to enjoy the activity with their partner or their friends or do the thing that they love doing. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's a fascinating question. And, um, you know, I definitely think there's contextual influences to health, including mental health. Um, so that, yeah, that, that's, That'd be really interesting to to dig into and, and see um, what the rates are. Yeah, because I was I thought about that question because I was thinking th- things like, you know, fear of spiders, like arachnophobia or fear of heights and stuff like that. I feel like that's quite universal. But then I was thinking of all these like, you know, more nuanced or um, lesser known phobias. Even um, I, I took psychology for two years, <laughs> didn't graduate, <laughs> but my, <laughs> my psych 101 teacher, she had a fear of, I um, uh, can't remember the name now, but it's like strawberries. You know how strawberries have the little holes in them? She, oh, yeah, she, yeah, it was trichophobia or something like that. Anyway, can't remember. Um, but she had that phobia. It was really, really bothersome to her. And she had explained that to us. And I was like, I've never heard of that before. And I was wondering if, and then, I, but I started to hear about it more and more in that region. And I was like, is this like a thing like that we are specifically dealing with? And then I moved out east and I'd, I never heard of it again. And I was like, this is so weird. So that's why I was so interested in that. So, so I would say actually you have you have a brain of psychologist. Please go back to school. And <laughs> you know, no, I mean that that's how often we learn stuff, right? We're like, oh, that's weird or that's interesting. I'm curious about that. And uh, you know, um, it's possible that in certain areas, a type of fairy uh, made people sick at one point, and there was that ah. kind of learning passed on through the brain. That yeah, you should avoid those. Those are, those are barf berries or something. I don't know exactly, but that, and, and that gets passed on. And we know, like, there's some interesting, um, uh, now I can't remember if it was done on rats or mice, but uh, it was looking at the impact of, of intergenerational trauma. And so basically, they paired uh, a painful stimulus, I think it was shock, with the smell of cherry blossom for these um, little rodents. And what they found was that they could make these um, little creatures afraid of the smell of cherry blossom by pairing it with something that was aversive. Now, the interesting thing was that the kids of those little creatures also found the smell of cherry blossom aversive in one generation, the next How generation. How does that get passed down? I mean, wild, right? Wild. That, that is wild. wild. It is. And like, there's so many interesting things with our brain development. Like, you know, at one point there was this idea that we're all tabula rasas or tab- like these blank slates that were born and it's all, you know, like nurture. And then other people are like, well, I think nature has something to do with it. <laughs> and I mean, now the, the psychologists are like, it's both. Like, we know it's both for most right. things. Um, and so, you know, if, if you look at sort of how we develop as humans, like, you know, most people will crawl before they walk, right? Most people babble before they speak. There's these kind of uh, un- unfolding in the development of the brain. And, you know, it's in some ways, there's certain things like especially for when you're dealing with anxiety disorders where you're like, catch up, catch up with me. Elevators are fine. <laughs> you yeah. know, or, right like whatever it is you're like come on brain <laughs> <laughs> right uh, and then you know but but it's interesting so I mean we don't really know much at all like it's there's so many mysteries out there and things still to be learned and, and scientific developments to be made but um yeah it's uh, the, the idea that there could be regional uh brain differences is like there's regional skin color differences yeah right right. makes sense when you think about how hot the sun is in particular areas so if that can get passed on in your skin and change over time and little frogs can develop in different ways and oh giraffes have black tongues so their tongues don't get sunburned when they're eating the tall leaves i mean it makes sense to us that we can be evolving humans in different ways depending on um you know what the environment is like in our area uh, you know, again, we're we're moving towards more of a global kind of what we eat 
than uh, uh, what we are exposed to. But yeah, it's, I think it's a really interesting, um, really interesting question. I mean, the cool thing about cognitive behavior therapy as a treatment for phobias is it doesn't seem to matter so much what the phobia is. The same type of treatment, the same type of approach seems to, uh, you know, kind of both lower anxiety and increase people's quality of living. So that's good is that we like you could come in and be like, I'm afraid of, okay, say something random. Um, toe hair. Well, I'm afraid can, of chains and water. So oh, yeah, yeah, that, that is a normal, normal thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah, toe hair is, I think, a bit more unusual. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we could, even though I've never treated, and I, it's, it's true, I've never treated anybody for toe hair phobia, we could apply the same types of principles and activities that we would for other types of phobias and expect to see a difference, which is cool. That is, that cool. is cool. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. How interesting. What what kind of approach is that? Or is it is it um oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like secret. <laughs> like you <laughs> That's a trade. No, secret. and this is, you know, in in my volunteer work, I'm on the board of directors for an organization called Anxiety Canada and they have a website, anxietycanada.com. My little plug for them. And an app that's free. And it's a nonprofit organization, so it's all um, we have some staff, but there's also a lot of volunteers. And the part of the mission is getting, uh, you know, scientifically based strategies for dealing with anxiety out there to the people who need them, the people who can't afford to access treatment or are in rural areas or, you know, just there's so many there's so many barriers to treatment, really, it, 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 unfortunately. And so, um, yeah, that's part of the mission there. Um, and so, yeah, if you are interested in some of those cognitive behavioral techniques of how to manage phobias, your listeners could go there and they don't have to be in Canada. They can be anywhere and learn about how, uh, you know, psychologists do go about helping people with phobias. And there's a lot of self-help techniques that um, work really well um, for you. And even just like step one, knowledge is power, like understanding what's happening in your body, in your brain, figuring out, okay, oh, these are my thoughts, these are my emotions, these are my behavior. Okay, I can't necessarily control how I feel, but I do have some choice over um, whether I touch the toe hair of myself or my partner, <laughs> or I avoid it. And if I touch it, I'm more likely to be able to, I don't know, have a good intimate relationship and, and, and learn that actually the toe hair isn't going to insert whatever you're afraid of. Um, I don't know, gag me and then I'm going to choke and die, um, you know, and eventually that, that anxiety goes down versus you avoid it and then you can continue with the belief of it. Again, you didn't say this belief, I'm just making this up, of right. to, to hair is toxic and to hair, uh, you know. And sometimes, you know, it's great when somebody knows, has a specific thought, like this is going to make me die or this is, I, I'm going to drown, I'm going to choke. Um, and then we can really get in there and work on those thoughts and restructure them so that they make more sense. Um, whether it, if you're overestimating the danger or if it's pieces, you're underestimating your ability to cope. Like, oh my God, if I threw up in a public bathroom, I would never be able to, you know, we can, we can actually, okay, well, let's say what happens if you do throw up and then what happens? And then, okay, oh, they do, you, nobody answers the phone to pick you up. So you're covered in vomit and that, you know, and we can actually like take you through and show you, okay, yeah, no, that's not pretty. Nobody wants that. But you could survive, right? Like that, that it doesn't get stuck in that loop. Because that's what happens sometimes with anxiety is we get stuck in the kind of the worry loop of the, the hardest part. We don't take it out and say like, okay, yes. And then after that, uh, his rally and then this would happen. Um, yeah, so that, I don't know. I can't remember what the question is. I'm just that I like talking about anxiety. So I'm like, yeah, no, no, well, but, no, no, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, there's some question there, but no, it shouldn't be a secret. And yeah, yeah being a, uh, learning about uh, phobias, anxiety, anxiety disorders is step one. Knowledge is absolutely power. Yeah, for sure. Well, and like you were mentioning earlier as well, that like when you had your first anxiety attack, you knew what it was. I think understanding it is like a huge part of it because I know for me with depression, um, 
now looking back I can see like where my depression started but at the time I didn't really know what it was and and even now you know kind of later into my 20s I'm still learning about things that are um, symptoms of depression that I thought were just me or you know like and, and so it's so helpful for me to just to know and understand that like okay that's correlated to this thing that I'm working on so you know it makes it a lot easier to manage. Absolutely. And I think then when we can create this little bit of distance and we can kind of act as our own, I mean, in cognitive behavior therapy, really one of our goals is to teach people how to become their own therapist, right? So that they can mm -hmm. go in and, and they're not actually dependent on, on therapists and, and they don't have to spend money. They can just be like, okay, what are my thoughts here? What are my behaviors? Is, is the way I'm thinking about this helping or is it actually making things worse? How can I change that up? What am I doing here? Is the thing I'm doing helping or is it actually making things worse? How can I change it up here? Like that's a, lo a lot of basically what you're doing is sort of tweaking those things to try and get you feeling better, but also living a valued life, not letting, um, you know, mental health issues get in the way of the stuff that's really important to you. And it's, it's amazing how sneaky uh, anxiety and depression and, uh, you know, other things can be. And they really do start getting in the way of the stuff that you want and and often again you know maybe they start as a helpful brain mechanisms to try and keep us safe and with addictions you know often it's like oh this whatever thing actually makes me feel better and makes me able to do this or maybe makes me able to socialize and then all of a sudden the solution becomes the problem mm -hmm. um, and it's taken over and you know it's it's a lot of work to kind of you know, center yourself and kind of recalibrate and, and, and get and, and get back on track. And none of us are perfect. Like, I, I know there's, there's another podcast where somebody has a history of addictions and, and actually came up recently that he had had a relapse. And that, that's that, true. Um, it was what, such yeah. a good episode. It was so <laughs> good. So, you know, I mean, that's like, to me, that's very brave. And, and I, I hope that more people can do that, right? Because it, the shame is this thing that kind of descends over everything and, and can really get in the way. And none of us are perfect. We're all, we're all humans. We're all trying. We're all struggling. We're going to go down. We're going to come back up again. Well, hopefully we're going to come get back up again. But I think it's easier to get back up again when you know that you don't have some fatal flaw and it's only you and that, yeah. it, you know, when you, when you have that kind of knowledge that, yeah, lots of us struggle with stuff and, um, you know, that's, that's part of the messy but beautiful human condition. I'm curious specifically with phobias, like, is there something kind of concrete that we can point to, like, as to where it stems from or does it kind of manifest in so many different ways? Oh, that's a good question. You mean, like, the dog bites you and then you become afraid of dogs, that kind yeah. of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, in terms of the etiology or what, like, where do they come from? Um, you know, it seems to be that this combination of sometimes it does pop up. And again, usually there's probably some adaptive reason for that. If not in your current environment, maybe a couple of ancestors ago. Um, so interesting. But, yeah. but definitely you can have situational experiences. You know, I've seen people who, for example, uh, have been on a lot of airplane flights. And they had a bad experience, and then that person who was never afraid of airplanes before suddenly is afraid of airplanes, and then doesn't get on the airplane. The boy's getting on airplanes, and then it, you know, and then the more they do that, the more that that fear kind of uh, turns into anxiety and, and, and settles in there, and um, and then we approach it that way. So yes, yeah, so it seems to be this combination of of both you can get a, a phobia at any age and it can be to something that you never used to be afraid of it's just yay anxiety <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, can, it can pop out of nowhere and then it can also and it can also make perfect sense right so that's kind of the way that works that that seems to be what the uh kind of the research shows i feel that because I, <laughs> when, when I was in high school, I would do like plays, I did dance, I did stand up comedy, I was totally fine, never had a problem, always wanted to be the one like reading out of the textbook. And going back to what you said, um, just a bit ago about how it just like 
but can pop up out of nowhere. Um, I, and surprise you, I was in college and I was preparing for this like presentation I had to give. I got up for the presentation, was fine. And the minute I opened my mouth, I had my first panic attack. I had, I had never experienced anxiety before, I feel, in my life. I was always so outgoing, you know, easy, easy breezy, could talk to anybody, get up, love to be the center of attention. And then all of a sudden, in my women's studies, <laughs> intro to women's studies class, mm-hmm. I'm like, it's uh, <laughs> like frog in my throat, like my chest went beat red. And, you know, it's, it's so, that I really am like so interested in the mind because of how it can just like, and yeah. then all of a sudden, you're completely sort of different, right? Well, and, and too, like, part of it is, you know, sometimes there's things that we think, for example, panic attacks, there's, you know, even part of the definitions of panic attacks, panic attacks will often say they come on as if out of blue, right? Mm-hmm. But then, you know, it's hard to tell, like, are they really out of the blue or had you had a bad night's sleep? Plus, somebody gave you kind of a snarky look. Plus, you were in a relationship that was not doing so like like you know what were the things like you know that That maybe perfectly aligned yeah yeah you know I I think sometimes and and you know when we're trying to figure out okay what are the triggers and then what thoughts did you have and what thoughts did you have in response to those triggers and what behaviors did you do and you know the 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 good thing about cognitive behavior therapy for anxiety is you don't actually have to know what caused something or how it started to be able to start making changes, right? Because we can just start with today. Today, how are you thinking about public speaking? Today, what are you doing about yeah. public speaking? And we can start from there and be looking at kind of in real time, okay, you had this huge thing. What were you thinking right before that? What was happening right before that? And we can even get in there in real time. And that, sorry, I'm I'm like, and that's really fun. But, <laughs> no. Obviously, it's hard when it's hard when you're doing it. But you know, as a therapist, we're like, no, let's 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 dig into this so that we can see. Because sometimes, you know, like there's this one little belief that kind of holding it all together. And when we can get at that, it's amazing how some of the anxiety will melt away. And that doesn't mean the anxiety wasn't very very real. Mm-hmm. It just means that there can be these little cognitive shifts or these little changes in behavior that we can do that suddenly people are like, oh, yeah, the, you know, and, and the first time I did that, nothing happened. But like, you know, the 20th time I touched the toe hair, it didn't seem as <laughs> scary, right? Right. There's going to be someone in the comments that's like, I've been scared of toe hair and I feel so seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't mean to belittle that at all. Like that, no, of course. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't matter what it is. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I personally like to use humor in therapy, but I wouldn't use it like second one of talking about toe hair. But yeah, eventually, yeah. usually, yeah. I mean, I think for most of my regular clients anyways, we're using humor as soon as we yeah. can. Yeah. <laughs> because it's, because it definitely helps take some of the weight um, out of the situation. And, and again, when we're looking at trying to create safety pathways instead of these danger learning pathways, because just unlearning danger doesn't seem to work as well. Like when they look at, uh, I, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I do like to read when I can uh, about um, the neurobiology of, emo- of emotions and anxiety in particular. And, and it seems that you know, kind of our danger learning centers in our brain are different from our safety learning centers. And we actually get more bang for our buck if we go for learning safety versus unlearning danger. Hmm. And again, if you think about kind of the way that we have evolved as humans, I'd be like, you know, don't take the batteries out of your smoke alarm, get rid of the smoke. Like, you know, again, it's like, how can we actually make things safer. We don't necessarily want to turn off our danger detection areas because they're very conservative. Some of us, again, have the Ferrari version, but, you know, they're (laughs) like, I don't care. You're still breathing. You're not dead. I'm doing my job, right? Like, I don't care if you didn't go on that date. I don't care if you failed women's studies. I'm doing a good (laughs) job. You're alive, right? Right, right. And so, again, I think, you know, with anxiety, like, you know, the more that you can develop compassion, an appreciation for that part of your brain and what it's trying to do while at the same time not letting it boss you around. 
right? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Bray. Yeah, right. I see that you're, you, you know, women's studies is important to me or that, you know, this is a very intelligent uh, group of students and I want to impress them that thanks for reminding me what's important, why I care about this. But, you know, making me not be able to speak is not going to help. So, right. <laughs> exactly. Do you right? Find that- and again, you know, we may have, have years and years of our evolutionary past where that same, you know, fight, flight, or freeze response absolutely saved somebody's life. Right? Previous yeah. finales were like, we hid and we were fine. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't jump off that cliff. You're welcome, Melanie. I'm like, okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> right? But in the moment, you're like, brain. I, I get, I can get frustrated with my brain, but I'm working. If I'm a, a work in progress, like all my clients, and like, <laughs> like you guys, I'm sure, uh, of trying to be more compassionate and appreciative of, of what exactly is happening and not get so frustrated with myself. But again, <laughs> work in progress. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you find that phobias are more common as people get older? Because I feel like from the outside looking at it, I would imagine almost that like, like kids would be having a lot of fears just because like they can't rationalize in the same way. But when I look at myself, I noticed that like I was pretty fearless the whole time. I was like a child and a teenager. And then as I got older, now I really second guess myself and I'm more fearful. I think my specific phobia is again, I haven't looked at the stats of this for a while because when you're a therapist, people, this this is the kind of thing that I, I should know to prepare for before, <laughs> you know, <laughs> need it, need to type interviews. But, um, I think from what I know, uh, phobias are more likely to emerge in childhood, but they can come out at any time. And what we also know is that there can be this sort of pylon that happens with, you know, kind of you have this anxiety and then this other stuff happens and then you get more anxiety and you get more anxiety, depression comes and joins the party or, you know, and so it makes sense too that that, um, they can be more vulnerable um, to other anxiety disorders as we grow up. And also life does get more complicated. Like, yeah. you know, one of the things that um, is a theme with and not necessarily specific phobias, but kind of some other anxiety disorders is a heightened sense of responsibility. Um, and we do have more responsibility at certain periods of our life. So if we're already prone to more responsibility, you know, kind of having the more sense of responsibility kind of piece. Uh, that can tip us over. Um, also tolerating uncertainty, right? Like, I think that there is a lot more uncertainty when you're older, right? I think kids, although they do have less control over things, I don't know. I, th- I think things get more complicated as you get older. Yeah, I agree with that for sure, because I I don't know what it is with my memory, but like, I remember almost everything. Like I can remember exactly how Too I felt much. when, yeah, when I was like six years old. Um, <laughs> but... I do remember like feeling very like I had purpose even so young, but it's like my purpose was to like get up in the morning and go to school and then come home and see my mom and get a warm mom hug. You know what I mean? Like it felt, yeah, (laughs) it felt like I knew what I was doing in my life. I'm like, Mm -hmm. this is what I'm doing and grade two is fun and and whatever. (laughs) But, but, you know, as you grow older, well, as I've, I've grown older, I should say, I do find that the, this is for me anyway, the less busy I am, the more I stress. Oh, for sure. Because it's almost as if like, I, I know that stress, we're talking about stress now because I go on tangents always, but, <laughs> but, um, where was I going with that? Oh yeah. Um, it's like that, that issue with like the lack of productivity, like feeling yeah. like you're not doing enough. Well, and like, I just, yeah, I feel like where's my purpose now? I mm. need to find my purpose. You know, when my dad was sick, I, I, it was a horrific time, obviously, but I had purpose yeah. in those three months. I was like, I know exactly what I'm doing in the morning. We have to be at these appointments, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it's such a weird juxtaposition between being in, um, you know, like experiencing like loss eventually and whatever, but also feeling like you have this, like you, like your whole almost this because you're like purpose. Yeah. What a weird thing. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I know stress, then there's some overlap with anxiety. And and I think the reason you, you go on tangents is because that just makes sense. Like a lot of the things are, are, inter- <laughs> yeah. are interrelated. Um, 
And I think, you know, having clear purpose or, or trying to figure out what your values are and, you know, kind of have a strategy for moving towards those is a really useful thing in terms of managing your mental health. And so that way, if you actually know where you're going and anxiety is trying to derail you, a phobia is trying to derail you, you can be like, okay, and you can kind of keep going towards what's more important to you. And if you don't actually, if you're not clear on that, it does, it's easier to get distracted. It's like if you are going to the mall to buy something, I don't know, people go in malls anymore? Oh. Anyway, <laughs> it's like being on the internet and you're trying, to, you're, you're looking to buy something specific and there's a pop-up ad, right? You know, and maybe if you weren't looking to buy something specific, that, that pop-up ad would, uh, you know, attract your attention more than, than when you have something specific to buy. So I got right. to date up to date with my shopping. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's nice to imagine for a moment that we could all be in the mall together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I think, again, you know, really taking that time to figure out what's important to you. Um, and, you know, for some people, it's, you know, about relationships or a job or educational uh, achievements. Other people, it's about being kind or being of service. I mean, it. It can be anything that, that is important to you. Those are your values, right? What's your kind of your deepest desires for how you act, right? Is a, one way of thinking about values. And I do think kind of having your eye on the prize can help you with the other stuff that can, can drag you down um, along the way. And I think right now, you know, one of the things that's happened with the pandemic is that, um, you know, we do have less structure that can kind of make it easier for us. It's yeah. like the difference between like there's a paved road and there's just like a bunch of bush and somebody stole our machete. Like, you know, I, I think having that structure in place helps us manage some of that uncertainty because it's not like uncertainty everywhere you look. And, and certainly I know a lot of psychologists are recommending, you know, the addition of structure where you can to help us to keep on track because there is this extra load of uncertainty. Um, and for people with anxiety um, and certain anxiety disorders in particular, you know, tolerating that anxiety um, or that uncertainty rather is, is even harder. And so figuring out, okay, what things do I need to do some problem solving at and actually control them? And what things do I have to actually sit with? I have no control over this. Yeah. Right. Uh, or, which is because anxiety loves to come in and tell us bad things are going to happen and they don't always happen, right? It's like, this hasn't even happened yet. Right. I'm curious, actually, um, kind of like speaking about the pandemic and things that like versus fears that um, aren't actually currently happening. So people that might maybe are like germaphobes or they're really scared of something like a pandemic happening, like how do you deal with that differently when it's a fear that actually is present, like it's currently happening? Uh, yeah, great question, Sam. And th I, I would say this is uh, this per period of time in my career has been the most challenging because normally when we're trying to figure out is this a fear, of concrete, imminent danger, or anxiety, an overreaction, an overestimation of the threat, an underestimation of our coping, I usually find it much easier to do. Right? Like if you're afraid of, you know, getting on a plane, we can look up some stats and say actually getting, you know. Uh, on a plane is relatively safe considering this and this, and we can talk about it this, we can do exposures. I mean, now it's, the line is so much blurrier. The, the you know, we're getting, it, I mean, for me, I always try and turn to the science first. Okay, like, what, what does it say? And right now, it's like, if you look at people, it's like, wear a mask, don't wear a mask, do this, do that. Like, I mean, people are confused. And um, you know, the scientists are out there trying to, you know, learn as much as possible and share that information with us. But it's, it, there's this lag, right? And we, you know, what may, it might have made sense six months ago doesn't make sense anymore. And, um, yeah, I think it's very challenging. I think things have gotten very blurry. Um, you know, it's, it's been interesting as someone um, who does work with people with a contamination focused uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. So the, that and contamination focus, it can be all different things. It could be lead, it could be mercury, but it, it can also be uh, germs and diseases. It could be COVID. Um, and it, there's also somebody who's come up with the term coronaphobia. So there is actually a specific phobia related to cor coronavirus. And again, like having some fear, being afraid makes sense. Like what, like what makes it? 
cross that line. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, the general kind of rule of thumb is that out of proportion idea, right? More distress, less of the sense that you could, you can, you can handle that. Um, but yeah, it's very, it's very hard. And again, people are different. Like there's some clients who I've had and who've like, no, I'm not different. Welcome to my regular. I'm always afraid of door handles. And <laughs> I'm not any worse. I'm prepared like, for this. Yeah. yeah, like, come on, man. Everybody's just joining my party. Um, <laughs> you know, whereas I would have predicted before this that, that that would be an especially vulnerable group. And and again, because humans are so interesting, there are some people who are fine, some people who are better, some people who are worse, um, you know, but you know, on average, the research has shown that people who already had anxiety disorders going into a pandemic, and um, specific phobia is a type of anxiety disorder, um, they have more anxiety. Again, not super, not super surprising. So more anxiety compared to the average person without any diagnosed mental health conditions and uh, more anxiety compared to people with depression as well. So. Um, actually, regarding... Um diagnosis uh i'm curious if you think that mental health because we've we've had like a lot of conversation around um how social media has kind of impacted so uh mental health and so i'm curious if you notice um that there's actually a rise in mental illness or if there's just more of a rise in people getting diagnosed oh just that small question okay so We don't have, we only have a few more minutes with Dr. Vidali. Okay. She's got to go soon, but. There, there's a huge debate in the literature over this or, and, and, and among professionals. You know, there are some people who are saying, no, like, this is not a rise. This is reduction of stigma. People are talking about this. Um, people are more willing to seek help. And, you know, that this is. This is not an escalation. Um, and then there are other people who are saying, here's the graph, here's when we got, you know, smartphones, and then this, this, here's this bump. It isn't just that. Um, like for me, and, and maybe this is a cop-out answer here, uh, but because I'm more of a clinician and not trying to strategize here, I'm like, I don't care so much. Let's get everybody who needs some help, some help. Mm-hmm. I'm, very right. prag- I'm, I'm very pragmatic. I'm like, I don't care if it was always this bad or not. Let's get these people some help. Yeah. Um, sure. Sorry. I, you know, I, 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 there, there is a, like a, a good intellectual response to, to that. And there are a lot of uh, people who, who are talking about it. There's been op-eds written about it. Um, but yeah, I definitely fall on the side of, I don't think it's something that people are going to lie about or exaggerate. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for whatever reason, more people are coming forward now, whether it's out of the shadows or out of the crap, I, like the, the extra things that are, 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 are extra making people extra vulnerable. It doesn't matter so much. Let's figure out how to get them better. Let's help, let, let's help people. Uh, but it's, it's such a good question and very, very interesting um, sure. to, to think about for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we will wrap this up. We know you're so busy. Um, is there is there anything you wanted to shout out? I know you shouted out the, um, uh, what was it called? Sorry, Anxiety, Anxiety Canada. Anxiety Canada website. Um, but yeah, if you, anything you want to let our listeners know about. Well, especially, yeah, if you do have any Canadian uh, listeners, there's the MindShift CBT app, which can help guide you through um, uh, the self-help strategies for a variety of anxiety disorders, including specific phobia. And then Anxiety Canada has also recently launched um, MindShift CBT Groups, which is like an eight-week facilitated program where you use the app, but you also get to talk to a group of other people and a facilitator to help you. Like, say, we were talking about the toe hair, right? You might not be like you start licking a toe hair. You'd start by, like, looking at a picture of a toe hair. And then you know, watching some, somebody else touch the toe hair and then you're, you know, touching the toe hair, whatever. It's, it's um, about building like a fear ladder and then exposing yourself to that and looking at what are my thoughts about this? Am I making any thinking errors? Like it, it's basically the, like the, the app will guide you through that. But then there's also these mindship CBT groups that, um, I mean, the goal is to, to have them there, no cost to people, but that's just a matter of how much 
fundraising we can do and such, but at least to have them there low cost for people. So I really do encourage people to go to um, anxietycanada.com, the website, and also check out the app. And it's all free and nobody's stealing like your privacy, you know, your, your <laughs> stuff. And I'm a volunteer. I do not make any commission if you, <laughs> if you go there. I just want to, um, you know, I just want to have a larger impact and get, you know, the, the science-based strategies and information to the people who, who need them. So, yeah, thank you. That's, That's awesome. awesome. For sure. Thank you so much for your time again. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah. thank you. All right, you guys, thank you so much for watching this week's Approachable uh, episode. And thank you again to Dr. Badali. And we will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.